I wonder if you would give a big Tassie welcome uh, to Stephen McAlpine uh, as he comes up, our guest speaker today. Hi, welcome, welcome, uh, Stephen. Uh, I, I have to confess uh, to him and to you that I'm a bit of a fanboy of uh, Stephen McAlpine. He's been writing these amazing blogs and he's so much cleverer than I am and has got such a way with words. Uh, and uh, I've, I think I've quoted you more in sermons uh, from your blogs and from your book <laughs> than just about anyone else. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, that you're here today. Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, Stephen, tell us a bit about your ministry, what you're oh, doing. Yeah. Uh, most of my uh, ministry life has been pastoring in churches, to be honest, um, from household churches through to uh, bigger churches over the last nearly 30 years. So my wife and I uh, live in a, another country called Western Australia. Um, <laughs> she's from uh, Cape Town. I'm from Northern Ireland, actually. And uh, then we have two kids, a 22-year-old who works in the church, one of the churches that I planted. So people say, how did your kids turn out so well? And I say, benign neglect. Um, <laughs> most of my, since I started writing, most of the things I'm doing now are consulting and speaking around some of the issues. So uh, really I wrote that book, Being the Bad Guys, uh, off the back of just listening to people in church, how their experiences were sharing Jesus and suddenly feeling that the cultural shift had changed, mm. that something was a little bit harder than it was in the past. I think yeah. that's... Yeah, that's great. Uh, this is a really terrific book. Uh, my chaplain, uh, Kelvin Todd, uh, read this uh, when it, as soon as it came out. And he said, you've got to read this book. I read it. I devoured it. Uh, I bought about 50 copies of it right, and gave sure. it uh, to all our ministry leaders. So a little commission. Keeping food on my table. The, that's great. Yeah. Away. <laughs> uh, uh, there are some copies of this on, on, the, uh, on the bookshelf. Uh, in two sentences, what does the book say? It says, uh, why is it like it is now for Christians and what are the bad responses that we could make and how does the gospel help us navigate a space where we may not get back to being the good guys culturally, but we can do it joyfully because of the hope of the gospel. Great. Uh, on the bookstall, uh, there's only a limited number, so there'll be a little stampede at morning tea uh, to get the ones that are there, but if not, uh, I'm sure you can grab it online. Stephen, uh, welcome. Uh, yeah, thank we're really you. delighted you're here. Uh, let me pray yeah, thank uh, you, for Richard. you. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you uh, so much for our brother Stephen, for the way he's thought uh, so carefully about culture and about the gospel and about uh, encouraging us to be bold in mission. And we pray, Father, that uh, you'd uh, pour your spirit on him now to give him clarity and uh, help him as he unpacks uh, these themes for us and equips us in our mission in your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give him another welcome. Thank you. Well, I uh, entitled this Never More Hostile, Never More Open. And what I really want to do is give you the 30,000-foot view, I think, of where we're at culturally, where our culture is, and how Christianity is challenged by things. Uh, there's a hostility uh, for us, but there's also an openness to the gospel that I think perhaps we uh, haven't had for a while, yet strangely at the time of hostility, it seems that the openness is, uh, can be there as well. So that's what we're going to look at. And for a hostile event, I know this is a, an Australian rules football state, is that right? Whew. Everywhere I go in New South Wales, I get dirty looks, to say the least. But I watched Guy Mason from City on a Hill Church try to explain how Jesus is all about life and love to David Koch on the Sunrise Show the day after a member of Guy's church, Andrew Thorburn, had held the position of CEO of Essendon Football Club for how many days? One day. One day. And uh, resigned. Because what had happened was that some sermons from Guy's Church, where Andrew's the chairman, had surfaced, and the Essendon Football Club uh, had suddenly got a conflict that the values of what we think about diversity and around sexuality are at odds with the sermons that this church proclaimed 10 years ago, and of which Andrew, who was not, not at the church then, is the chairman. Now, I texted Guy the day before the event and said, how do you think it'll go? He said, oh, I've got a bit of media training. I think it might go okay. Famous last words, number 235, I think, because David Koch just slammed him. It was a... I used to watch Doctor Who when I was a kid. You know that scary... If you're at my age, you remember the scary music from Doctor Who? And I'd hide behind the couch. <laughs> I felt a little bit like that for Guy, because it was... 
you Christians, especially those of you who believe the Bible, you, you just, the problem culturally, you're, you're, you're bigoted, you're homophobic, you, you're retrograding your views of end of life and start of life and everything in the middle of life. And it was, it was a real, you know, sock full of penny coins across the back of the head. No matter how sharp guy's haircut and cool his look, that doesn't cut it anymore in our cultural moment. Now, those are the headlines. Those are the headlines. It's hot in the headlines in the Sydney Morning Herald and the ABC and things like that. But it's not just the headlines, I think, where we feel some of the cultural heat. It's personal as well, isn't it? And uh, I have three brothers and two half-brothers. There's six of us, six boys. Uh, my dad was married twice. My mum and his second wife never met until my dad's deathbed. And I introduced it, which shows you that the sexual revolution had a crack at my family as well, in many respects, right? But at my half-brother's wedding, I was emceeing it, and he's not Christian, and he was marrying someone from South Africa also, and his wife-to-be, his wife's brother and brother-in-law were coming from South Africa for the event in 2016, the year before the plebiscite in Australia, and they, her brother and brother-in-law, with their young daughter, Surrogate. They were married in South Africa in 2016. And my wife and I, and I'm pastoring a church, would sit at this long table, and they sat opposite. And the first thing you ask someone is their name. And the second thing you ask someone is, what do you do? And they asked me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a used car salesman who sells fentanyl to young children after, you know. I felt like saying that, right? <laughs> because I didn't want to say I'm a pastor. Well, I did, but I thought, oh, do we have to go there? And so I said, I'm a pastor in a church. And straight away, the question was, can a gay couple come to your church? Uh, that, was, that was my koshy moment at, the, at that time. I thought, how, do, how do I answer that? And we'll get into how I, and I said, of course they can. Of course you can. But that's not what they were asking me. They were saying, does your framework of Christianity value and affirm and celebrate what we are and who we are. Now, two things about that. The first thing is that this shows how much the world has changed in the sense that they were introduced to me as a married couple, whereas 30 years ago, they would have called themselves friends because the world has changed. It was an away game for them 30 years ago and it's a home game now. <laughs> You get what I'm saying. They could ask me that very quickly and lean into it, knowing that I might be on the back foot. It was a very interesting experience because it suddenly made me realise that these things are personal in our lives as well, that all the time we're getting asked about Christianity, it feels like it can be a hot-button topic. What do I say when I go to work? Who am I offending? <laughs> Everyone's got a backstory. But what I also realised is that I started to say, yes, of course you can, and one of the things I might have done was start to ask some questions first before doing the Christian apologetic thing of explaining why. Do you get what I'm saying? It feels like we're in a place where we have to sit and listen to what people are asking us before we start to launch into our well-prepared apologetic frameworks because people are asking big questions of us and it feels hostile. Now, here's some scary words on a page which I'll read to you from Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And Carl Truman, it's called, uh, subtitles, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism and the Road to Sexual Revolution. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The intuitive moral structure of our modern social imaginary, I say that every morning before breakfast, right? <laughs> Prioritises victimhood, sees selfhood in psychological terms, regards traditional sexual codes as oppressive and life-denying and places a premium on the individual rights to define his or her own existence. And that simply means that the water we swim in, the intuitive moral structure, the, the way we think culturally out in our wider society, the things that are possible are suddenly shifting or have shifted. When he says it prioritises victimhood, I'm saying this carefully because the church has created victims, is that my brother's brother-in-law and brother can now ask me, hey, what about you? 
with a louder voice than perhaps they were allowed to 30 or 40 years ago. That voice has been dialed up. And at the same time, Christians can't go around saying, hey, we're the victims here. That doesn't work. No matter if you feel it, just don't, that's not where it's at. The other thing, it sees selfhood in psychological terms, and this is a big issue that we view and we see with the whole huge gender and identity issues in our cultural moment. My wife is a clinician, clinical psych, and say 40 years ago, if you went to see a clinician and you were, this is your physiological self, and here's your psychological self, and your psychological self feels like a woman trapped in this himbo male body. And the, the job of the clinician was to say, I will help you align your psychology with your physiology. Which way is it now? It's the other way around. Because we are psychological selves first and foremost in our modern setting. And to say something to someone, even you go, I love you, but I don't agree with you on anything, is almost seen as psychologically stepping on someone and squashing them. It's very hard to have a conversation that does not step on identity issues that are dealt with psychologically, and that is seen as quite abusive. So we have to navigate these spaces very carefully. Of course, it's not all about sex and gender, but in our cultural moment at the moment, those are what we call the shibboleth issues. The other thing it says, it places a premium on the individual's rights to define his or her own existence. This is the expressive individualism of the day. But here's the thing, Christians, we do that too. <laughs> we, we, we swim in the same water. And part of us as Christians is our default is to say, well, I come into church and the first thing I'm doing coming to a new church is scanning the room to see, is this the place I should be? Will this comfort me? Will this sort out my life? Will this have good things for my kids? Well, and one of the things as a pastor that I find I struggled with most was meeting people who were 50 with three teenagers rocking up to my church who'd been to six different churches in the last 10 years. And their teenage kids are like, here we go again. Because they're just looking for the right church because it's about them expressing their individual sense of self. That's where we're at culturally at the moment. And I, and I wrote, shameless plug, being the bad guys, how to live for Jesus in a world that says we shouldn't, because there's been that shift for us culturally that somehow we go, we were partly, maybe we weren't the good guys, but we were kind of the lame guys. <laughs> I was <laughs> growing up at school in hard scrabble Perth. It was kind of weak being a Christian, and now it's kind of, you could be part of the problem, not part of the solution to our cultural moment. If we could just get rid of all the dogma that Christians have, it would all be kind of okay. But I want to say and this is that we think about the bad, the, the big scary stuff that makes the headlines, and I meet plenty of Christians who are struggling with that, and plenty of Christians who, I mean, lots of people my age who say, my son and my daughter no longer believes in Jesus because of some of these issues. But I would say it's not so much the so-called bad life that takes us away from Jesus in our Australian culture as the good life. The good life. When Jesus says that persecution will come on account of the word, in this parable of the soils, he immediately switched to another soil where the good life will take you away from Jesus, just as readily. Now, my wife and I and our kids went to Mindari Keys in Perth. It gets above 30 degrees there about every day, you know. Just thought I'd say that in Tasmania. And Mindari Keys for a holiday, and one Sunday afternoon we went down to one of the, the, the restaurants near here. It's a beautiful spot. Look, the keys are beautiful. They look like sort of an Italian area, except on the other side of that rocky outcrop there, it's blowing a gale. It's pounding waves. In fact, the sign on the beach says, this is not a safe beach to swim in. Oh, I just paid a good Airbnb cost for no beach to swim in. But on the other side, it's chaos. But this human-made little shelter of Pleasure Island is in the middle. And we go down to the restaurant and it's heaving with people on a Sunday afternoon having a lot of fun and I said to my wife do you think anyone even thinks about Jesus in this setting they don't need him 
the good life can do it for a very long time. Except, of course, sometimes a wave does come over the good life and crush you, doesn't it? Sometimes the winds of reality break through the little Mindari Keys life that you've crafted for yourself or your friends have crafted for themselves. Suffering, pain, death, disappointment. And suddenly the good life isn't so good. And what I want to say is in those moments in Australia, we're finding that people are starting to ask questions again about what's going on, what is life about? Because the good life isn't always good. Carl Truman's book is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. My wife is a clinical psychologist. She would say it's the rise and failure of the modern self, propped up by a lot of Medicare money. And I say it facetiously, but you can say what you like about the sexual revolution, but it's built us a great house in Perth down by the river because my wife is booked out with deep anxiety, people of deep anxiety and worry and stress about life. And if I am supposed to be this amazing person, why isn't it happening? What's going wrong? So we have this thing, as we call it, expressive individualism, where I'm supposed to present myself to the world and express who I am. And that's the water we swim in. Now, Rory Shiner, that's not Rory Shiner, by the way, but <laughs> Rory is just as smiley as that. <laughs> Rory says these words in an article in the Gospel Coalition. We are not argued into expressive individualism. We are formed into it. To live in modern Australia is to be part of a relentless discipleship program. Every Pixar and Disney film, every graduation speech, every new novel and Netflix series is 100% on point. Your purpose in life is to find the true inner you, psychological self, and then to express that to the world. God is framed out. You see, we're not combating something with a discipleship program called the gospel. We're combating another gospel discipleship program with the gospel discipleship program. It's a competing discipleship program. That's what we're experiencing culturally at the moment. And it's a pretty good discipleship program. I go to Sydney a lot and I'm staying in an apartment there and everyone says, when you leave Jesus behind, and the, it'll be terrible. It's going to be a zombie apocalypse. They'll be dancing and partying, and people having a good time. It's just awful, right? And I look out over the balcony, it looks pretty good pretty good. Every Pixar, every Disney film is discipling us into expressive individualism. God is framed out. See, what's the, the solution to that is not buy five acres in the hills with bean spam shotgun and wait for the zombie apocalypse and form a cult, okay? I just, so you might live there already because there's a lot of hills around here, but... <laughs> You see, the solution isn't Christian Pixar. It isn't Christian Disney. Or a Christian novel that always ends happy. The solution is framing God in to everything. The solution is you as a Christian saying, I will get up today and despite the social imaginary saying, if there is a God, he just wants me to be happy and do what I like, I will get up and say, though he slay me, I will bless him. I will get up today and say, I will take up my cross and follow him. It's to frame God into my life and our lives together in every possible way we can. Because ain't nobody got time to set up Christian Pixar. But we're called to frame God in in a secular world, as if he matters and as if he has weight to him. As if it matters what he thinks I do with my body. That it matters what I am like at work and how I respond to things. That it matters that how I do marriage, singleness, loneliness, joy. Framing God in is the issue as a Christian. Framing him in as if he matters 
And I think when we do that, rather than shrinking back, there's a great opportunity for the gospel in the lives of people looking on and going, I know that the good life is supposed to be about expressive individualism, but it's crushing me. Or I know that the good life is about doing what I want, but I look at some of the evil things that are happening and I don't like that. The late Tim Keller. Hmm, slides come up a little different. The modern self is exceptionally fragile. While having the freedom to define and validate oneself is superficially liberating, it is also exhausting. You and you alone must sustain and create, or create and sustain your identity. This has contributed to unprecedented levels of depression and anxiety and never satisfied longings for affirmation. You might have grown up in the era, if you're a millennial, where everyone gets a trophy. <laughs> everyone is affirmed. I'll just affirm you now, just in case you're feeling a little bit <laughs> tense about it. But see how much affirmation's enough? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And the gospel sweeps that away, as Keller has said, quoting, you're worse than you think you are. That's not affirming. But more loved than you dare hope. And the liberty that gives you to go around and look at my brother and brother-in-law, Bayers and Leonard, who I know quite well, and go, I'm worse than I think I am. Because they, when I have a big view of who God is and what he's done, other humans are not too big, but they're not too small either. I don't have to despise them if they don't agree with me. Do you know what size they are? Human-sized, just like me. I seem to have shrunk the last few years, but anyway. <laughs> There's something superficially liberating about expressive individualism, but as my wife has discovered, her clinic is full of people who say, I've broken that lever off in my hand and it's not working. Not working. Is there hope? Or are we in a slow, steady decline because the gospel isn't taking root in anyone's life anymore at a rate of knots in Australia, so it seems. Let me finish with a gospel story. Last year, it's a year ago last week, at the network of churches that I belong to, Providence Church, of which Rory Shiner, you may have heard of, is I mentioned him, the smiley guy made of snow. Um, he's the senior team leader, and his brother-in-law, who's also a good friend of mine, Ollie, uh, he's came up to see me because it was a big festival after um, after church with food and you know party and all that sort of stuff after the gathering of three three churches. And he said, "I want to introduce you to someone. This is Claire. She works with me, and she's just become a Christian." And I was oh, a forty-year-old woman who I looked at her. She was, doesn't look like a Chinese national student at university, so I don't know what's going on here. And my friend Ollie works as the head of Westfield's design fit-outs in Australia, and she was part of his creative team. So a creative, white, well-educated, happily married, her husband is there. How did you become a Christian? That's like impossible. <laughs> and she told me that something was missing despite everything that she had. She felt something was not right. And then she saw Ollie at work during COVID when people were getting laid off, and she said, there's something about the way he lives his life that feels different, looks different. And it was that he'd framed God in to everything. And she started to talk about it. And she started, she started to say, oh, well, could I read the Bible? Yeah, you could read the Bible. I could get you a Bible. And, you could, and then could, could I come to church? You could, yeah, you can come to church. And church is uber funky. No, it wasn't. It was just a normal, everyday church. And Miss White Western creative, happily married lady came to church and became a Christian. And I used to be a journalist, so I got great journalistic questions, and I said, how does it feel? 
And she said, it feels light, like a burden's rolled off me. I mean, there's a Sankey's revivalist hymn from the 50s that says that was a cliche, wasn't it? But that's what she felt like. The, the, the sense of, I have to do it all, has gone. Now, somewhere in the mix, she's repented and believed in the gospel and trusted Jesus as her Lord and Saviour and turning from sin and turning to righteousness. But that's what she felt in the moment. And I said, in another great journalistic moment, what else does it feel like? <laughs> and, and she was... She said, it feels like I don't need the approval of other people anymore. We're, we're a culture where everyone is an expressing themselves individualistically before a watching world. You are your own, but you are never alone. That's the world we live in. And suddenly, something had changed in her life that lifted her burden and so her approval was firmly in Jesus and what he'd done for her and who he was. That's the cultural moment we live in. The headlines are, CEO lasts one day. But the average person is feeling more like Claire. Maybe they're not. But the waves will come over into the key at some stage in people's lives. And those are the moments when you framed God into yours that give you the opportunity to speak into someone's life with the gospel, even when it feels hostile, because it is a hostile world. But from how I see it going forward, it's never been as open as well. I think I'm about out of time, but I want to give you some encouragement through some books. Just to read around some of these issues, I think. So, Being Christian After Christendom is a great book by David Riedfeld. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And David is really asking the question of, what does it mean to be Christian after all the Christian-y bits have gone from the cultural frame? You know what I mean? Anyone remember Lord's Prayer at school and stuff like that when you had to say that? And, and maybe you just had to go to church and wear itchy pants and sit in a pew and nobody's got time for that anymore, right? But this is a great book to unpack what's going on in our culture. What does it mean to be the bad guy? What does it mean to be the people who are perhaps not at the centre of where the culture is going, but perhaps to the side? What does it mean to have, to lament it? That was the past. But also say, what is God doing now? in this cultural moment and how can he change people? And it's got really good questions in it as well. It's worth reading, so that's a great book to read. And then these ones from the back of the... Uh, the one on, I think, What God Has to Say About Our Bodies by Sam Albury is a great book because who I am and my body and all those questions are big questions in our cultural moment. And what the gospel says about that and the good news that God says about our bodies is actually quite liberating. And Sam writes from the perspective of being a single, same-sex attracted man who works uh, in church and uh, speaks around the world. And he says the gospel is good news for our physical selves. It's not an abstract idea. It's something for our very physicality. And in a culture that's obsessed with the body, maybe God's got something to say about our bodies that liberates us and makes it good news. So that's worth a read. I love this book, The Air We Breathe. How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress and Equality by Glenn Scrivener. An Australian guy, lives in the UK now. It's a great book to give to people who might be asking questions, who are not Christian. It's a great book to read for yourself to see all the values that he lists, freedom, kindness, progress and equality, are very progressive values in our world, but they didn't come from nowhere. The gospel framework transformed society back in the Roman Empire era through those things. They're not universal human values. They're Christian human values that have spread across the world because of the gospel. And this is a great book for understanding that. And going into a little bit of depth for people who might have questions about it because it's written in such a way that it's to the inquirer. It's a great book to read. 
Another book I picked by a friend of mine, Adam Ramsey, Truth on Fire, Gazing at God Until Your Heart Sings. I like reading on culture and I like doing all those, you know, savvy, sassy things about where we're headed. But, you know, every now and then I have to go, let's just examine whether my love for Jesus might grow cold in the midst of that because that's completely possible, isn't it? It's a great devotional book about the goodness of God that takes truth but warms it up. The way you're going to be noticed by the world as living for Jesus isn't just that you have truth, but that it's warm, that it's compelling. And this is a great book, unpacking that by Adam Ramsey, lives in Queensland, uh, runs Liberty Church, and he's the head of Acts 29 in Australia. Fantastic book, Truth on Fire. I'm going to invite our uh, MCs up to finish. I think I've just about nailed 11 o'clock.